My name is Nicole Thomas, and I'm a software engineer at SaltStack. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right, so welcome. Um, I'm really glad to see so many of you here. Um, uh, as I said, I'm a software engineer at SaltStack. Um, if you've ever submitted a pull request or an issue or anything like that to the Salt project, you've probably interacted with me. Um, I'm on the open source team, on the core team. Um, and uh, if you, if I haven't gotten to say hello to you yet, um, please come and say hello. If you haven't ever submitted anything to our project and you would like to, come say hello. Um, we'd love to have you and, and get involved. Um, so today we will be talking about the journey that a salt job takes. Um, basically, um, from when you enter a command in to the at the CLI, and that whole entire process as it runs from the master out to the minions, and then the return back to the CLI when you see the return from the minions, right? So what we're first gonna do is we're gonna kind of talk about a little bit of the basics of what um, I'm, uh, what a salt job is and within the confines of this talk, um, a couple of different types of salt jobs. Um, then we're gonna talk about the high level overview of that basic flow, kind of talk about some of the components that are involved. And then we're also, then we're gonna start diving into some of those main architectural components. And as we do that, we're gonna follow where the job is going. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna do a, a little bit, look a little bit at job management. So what is a SALT job? Um, right, that's the whole, uh, real key component of salt is just this execution of commands, right? So you have salt, my minion, test stop ping. Um, so a salt job is basically a unit of work and that encompasses all of that moving pieces that I kind of defined before, from the CLI to the client, um, out to the master, out to the minions, and back again, right? So we have a lot of different components, we have a lot of processes, and we have a lot of events flying around, et cetera. So we have a lot of jobs that are running in many places. So I'm hoping that after uh, this talk, you'll have a better understanding of um, that sequence of events so that you can kind of take that and apply it to all different kinds of paradigms within SALT. <laughs> so we have a couple different types of jobs. Um, many jobs running in many places, but they generally fall in three main categories. We have the remote execution bit, which is what we'll be focusing on today, right? We have masters that are talking to minions, and um, minions are doing the work. That's the salt command. Then we also have um, local jo jobs that run directly on the master, right? So an example of that would be the runners, salt run command. And then we also have jobs that run directly on the minion um, with the salt call command. Um, so like I said, we're gonna be focusing mostly on the remote execution piece so we can kind of see how that job flows. Um, but you can apply anything that we learned today to the other um, types of jobs as well. Um, this will hopefully give you a deeper understanding of how SALT works and, and that you can um, use that for troubleshooting or um, figuring out how to fire your own events on the event bus and things like that. <clears throat> so, um, Let's talk about the basic job flow. So there's four main components that we're gonna talk about with the SALT execution. Um, and uh, we're gonna be dealing with this really basic command, SALT, my minion, test up ping. So the first part is where we enter at the CLI, right? Sitting at the command line, we type in our command, and the CLI is just a very lightweight wrapper around um, our other well-defined uh, APIs. So this is what handles the salt part of the command, right? Um, and we enter the code at this point um, after we do some parsing and things, of course. But we're looking at, if you wanted to follow along, you can look at the code here. It is located in the salt CMD class in the um, CLI, CLI salt.py file. Um, but yeah, so basically the CLI just is, you enter the command and it displays the results to you. It's pretty simple. From there, we go to the defined API for the salt command, that's the local client. The local client basically gets those um, inputs from the CLI, so that would be the targeting information, remote execution function, um, and any extra arcs that might be passed along with that, and it passes that off to the master. 
The other thing, basic function that the, CL, the local client does is it just waits for minion responses to come back. And then as those minion responses come back, it shoots them back up to the CLI so you can see the response from the minion. Um, so, so far, right, we're doing a salt command. Um, we're executing this on the master, right? So the CLI and the local client are both located on the master. Um, and so the master, which is in master.py, um, receives that input from the local client and then does some processing around that, right? So after it does that initial processing, it passes or it publishes the command out to the minions. Minion, um, it, you know, is waiting for those uh, publications. It uh, does some self-selection uh, and decides that this command applies to it. And it runs the command. And then it returns that uh, data back to the master. And then that basically goes all the way from the master, you know, goes back to the master. And then the master passes that to local client. Local client gets it to CLI. And the CLI displays the result. So, you know, Pretty high level overview, right? <clears throat> We've already kind of defined what the CLI does. It's pretty basic. We don't really need to define it in much more, um, much more than just saying that it's the wrapper because most of the work is being done um, at this point at the local client level. So it takes that CLI input, right? It takes that targeting information. What minions are we targeting? Um, in this case, that would be my minion, right? Um, then it takes that remote execution bit, the module.function, test.ping, and any extra arguments, right? So test.ping doesn't have any extra arguments. It's pretty simple, but um, if we did, that would also be wrapped up here and passed to the master. So um, it makes a request to the master to say, hey, we've got some work to do. Um, and then after that, it is basically just listening to responses to the requests that it makes. Um, so there's a concept of an expected minions list. Um, so the expected minions list is, uh, comes back from the master. The master does a little bit of processing to say, oh, I see what you're passing me, and here's my best guess of what I think will return. This is useful because we want to know, we want to have a way for the local client to know when it should be done waiting for returns. Um, so, and that's done with this expected minions list. The master generates that list uh, by, it uses the information in salt key, right? What are the accepted keys that we have? And it also uses some open TCP connections to help um, inform that list. Um, and then of course it also is waiting for minion returns. Um, so those are the most common things that it's listening for. This happens, uh, this process kicks off in the local client class in the CMD CLI command. Um, and that's basically where we're sending the minion returns as they come back. And, uh, and it just waits for minions to return or if we hit a timeout. <clears throat> so now that we've talked about the local client, let's kind of talk about some of these master components, right? When you start your master, a whole bunch of processes start. Um, we're not gonna talk about all of them, but we will talk about some of the main ones as they relate to a job. The first thing that we're gonna look at is the rec server process. Now the rec server, basically all it does is it receives requests and it just distributes that work to any available M workers. The M workers there, I put five little boxes because the default number of processes we spin up is five, so. Uh, if you've ever seen the worker threads uh, configuration, that's what that means. Um, and the worker processes, or the M workers, are basically just worker processes that um, manage uh, backend operations for the master. There's also a publisher process that's running, and that's what sends the commands out to the minions, right? And then we also have the event bus. I know you guys have been hearing a lot about the event system and the event bus, right? So it's a core component of Salt's event system. Um, and basically events are fired onto the bus and event listeners are subscribing to the bus. Um, <clears throat> and then when the event publisher takes those master events and then republishes them to anyone listening. So let's kind of talk about that event system a little bit more. Um, just, you know, for your information about how this is sort of works. Um, so the event system you know, we're firing these events onto the event bus, right? And um, 
this takes place in the utils.event.py um, file. Uh, if you wanted to look there for more information, you can see uh, how we're starting the um, event publisher, how you can subscribe to the event bus, and how you can fire events. <clears throat> but so the event bus is basically an open system that's used for sending information to notify Salt and any other listeners about um, operations. Now, it's important to note that there's an event bus that runs on your master, and there's also an event bus that runs on your minions. Each minion has its own event bus. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. And you can subscribe to either one. Um, we have many kinds of events. Also, the event bus, we'll talk about that, right? So it's used for this inter-process communications. We use um, Unix domain sockets for that. And then it's also used for network transport. And it's made of two primary components the sockets that publish the events, as well as the event library, which I was just talking about in event.py, that listens to the events and sends events out into the SALT system. Okay, so what does an event look like? Um, we have many kinds of events. On the master alone, we have authentication events, um, key events, runner. Um, we'll see minion start events, uh, cloud events, and then, of course, we also have job events, right? So a job event uh, is, well, the, event, the structure of event is a dictionary. Uh, the first thing it has is a tag. And this is what we use to identify um, the actual event. So for a new job, like test.ping, it looks like that. Salt, job, the unique job ID, and then with the tag, new. And then we also have a dictionary of data that contains information about the job, right? The job ID is there the target, um, my minion in this case, the list of expected minions, the type of target, so that could be a grains targeting or glob targeting, right? The function, kind of seeing a theme here, we're passing all these things around. <laughs> uh, targeting, function, extra arguments, right? Um, so that's kind of what you would look for if you wanted to look at the event bus and see your events coming through. Okay. So let's go back to our master component slide here and pick up where we left off with, I said, the local client passes that information to the master, right? Well, how does it do that? First, what it does is it makes a connection to the master's rec server on TCP 4506. And the rec server receives that request and then it farms out that work to an available M worker process. And it does that over your workers.ipc. <coughs> At that point, the, the M worker starts doing all kinds of work that we talked about, right? Um, it starts checking for authentication it, um, and starts looking around to see, you know, is this user authenticated? Um, is it authorized to run this command? Um, and then that's where it starts actually creating the job ID. So um, we can look at that in the code, not on that page. Can you guys see that okay? Sorry? Bigger. bigger? Okay, I'll try to make it bigger here. How's that, better? Yeah. Great, okay, so let's look for publish command. Okay, so this part takes place in the master.py file. We're in the clear funks class and we're looking at the publish function and that's where some of this sort of initial pre-processing work takes place. Okay, so at the very top, you can see we're getting a publisher ACL and we're checking to see if this user is blacklisted. If the user is blacklisted, we show you an error and we return, right? Um, the next piece that's interesting is on, uh, let's see, right here. This is where we're generating that list of expected minions, that call to CK minions, which you can go and look at that if you want to. Um, it, uh, or ckminions.checkminions, that's where we're generating that list of actual expected minions that are our best guess of who should return, right? Um, then after that, we start doing some checks for authentication, uh, making sure that whether you're using EAuth or a token like with Salt API or something like that um, is actually authorized to access the master. And then after we pass the authentication checks, we also go through some authorization checks um, to make sure that, okay, this user is authenticated to run commands, but is it authenticated to run this command, right? If you have something defined in EAuth or something like that. 
So once we get that part past those checks, um, we do, sorry, it's a little hard to see from over here. Here we go. So here's where we're actually generating the job ID. This is where we, and once that job ID is generated, we pass it to um, the prep pub function. Now the prep pub function, what that does is it takes um, all the data we've passed it in so far and um, it starts firing some events on the event bus. So let's look at that because we need to generate a payload before we publish to the minions, right? So if we look at that really quickly, um, we'll see right here um, is where we fire the event that the minions list goes back, or it's fired on the event bus so that the, the local client can pick up that event and say, oh great, I have my expected minions list. Now I know what to wait for. That's that event right there being fired. Then we do some um, job load preparation, you know, uh, get that dictionary right where we need it to be. And then we fire another event right after that. And that's where the <clears throat> M worker announces the uh, job on the event bus. So let's go, sorry. <laughs> So let's go back to our uh, master component slide, right? So we talked about those two um, events getting fired on the event bus. So how that works is the master, or the M worker process fires that on the event bus, right where we saw in the code, that does that over master event pull IPC. And um, then the request server publishes that out to all connected listeners. So in the case of the first event, um, the local client is waiting for that event, so that goes back to the local client, or the local client is subscribed to it and it picks it up. And then the second event, when the job is announced on the event bus, is picked up by the publisher. So the publisher does that over publish full IPC. And then at that point, we are able to um, encrypt the message and send it out to publish it to the minions, right? And we do that over TCP 4505. All right, so. And so now we're at the point of the job where the minion is ready to do some work. So the minion has the salt minion process running, right? You start your salt minion and it connects to the master, it authentic it's authenticated, the salt, its key is accepted, right? Um, and it's subscribed to the master publisher and the master rec server, right? So. Uh, what does this process do? So this process is um, pulling the master's receive, receive socket at 4505, and it detects that a job has been published. So this job goes out to all of the minions that are subscribed to the master, but the, ma the minion is what decides whether or not it should execute the job. So it, it detects the job, it pulls it off from the socket, and it decrypts the message. And it's like, great, I need to do some work here, right? So while it's um, and then we fork a new process. So we do that so that that minion process can continue to receive um, other master publishes, right? Um, and we can process many, many requests this way, right? Um, so that that main process is only blocked during that worker process initialization. So then we have the actual work. We're finally to the point where we're going to actually run test.ping on the minion. Um, so this happens in the minion class in minion.py, um, and where we're at right now is in the thread return function. So uh, we have our new process, we run the actual job and do the work. Um, sometimes if you're running something more than a test.ping, that also includes like, oh, I don't have the state file that's cached, so I need to get that from the master, right? That might involve some of that work, but in this case, it's just a test.ping, so it's gonna return true. Um, it encrypts its return, and then it sends the return to the master um, back to the rec server. We also have an, uh, oh, and then the process exits once it's sent to the master. Um, so we also have an event bus on the minion, as I mentioned before, so why do we have a minion event bus? Um, a couple different reasons, right? The forked process needs a way to communicate with the main master process. Um, and uh, we also can use that as an interface to um, 
fire other jobs on the Minion event bus, listen to the Minion event bus, things like that. And the event bus that's, that provides all those mechanisms. Okay. So now we're back to the master. The Minion has returned. It's returned to the rec server at TCP 4506, right? And when the master rec server process receives the returns, we use a router dealer pattern to allocate available M workers. And then the M workers start processing those minion returns. Again, this prevents blocking, right? And is um, asynchronous. <clears throat> so the M worker receives the job. It decrypts the minion's return. And then it again, it fires that event onto the event bus. Um, at this point, we also are doing some work to store the job in the master job cache. Um, and you'll note here that I've added an AES funks underscore return. So when the minion returns to the master, we use that function to actually start processing the return. <clears throat> and in that function, um, we call out to, um, let's, well, we can just go look at it. We call out to the job uh, utility. So in utils job.py, we have this first function here, the um, store job function. And here we do a bunch of processing of like whether or not you're running a returner, where should we store the minion um, return in the job cache, um, all through here. And once we do that, we have get to this if event clause here. So if we have this event, now we need to fire that event on the event bus. This is where we do that actual firing um, that the minion has returned. Um, <clears throat> so if you wanted to look at that some more, there's that. Okay. <clears throat> so at this point, the local client is waiting for returns. Um, the job gets fired, the minion return gets fired onto the event bus. The rec, or the, um, sorry, event publisher notices it on the event bus, fires it out, or republishes it to the listeners, and that's where the local client has been waiting for minion returns. Um, at that point, the minion return goes to the local client, and then the local client passes that off to the CLI, and you see the return. So that's kind of the whole process in a nutshell. <clears throat> so, you might have a couple of questions, sort of, okay, I made this distinction between using the ClearFunks class and the AES Funks class. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that um, the ClearFunks uh, published class handles the, or ClearFunks class, when we were looking at the published function, it handles that initial handshake between the minion and the master when we do that key exchange. It also handles all of the intramaster, intramaster communication and then AES, AES Funks does everything else, right? We wanna make sure that those returns from the minions are encrypted and things like that, right? So um, sometimes that's a point of uh, confusion for people. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, the next question you might have is, okay, test.ping, great. Not super um, uh, computationally intense on the minion, right? Not waiting for a long time. So how do we handle that? How do we handle it when you're installing packages, you're running a really long high state or something like that? Well, we handle that with at the local client level and that expected minions list. That's why this part is, the expected minions list is important. So we have a default timeout set up, set to five seconds. If the local client has not received a response from the minion that it expects to receive a response from within that five second timeout, it will send a request of the job, to, or will ask about the status of the job. And it goes through that same general workflow, right? Like it makes a connection to the rec server and it goes through all those processes and it goes out to the minion and the minion says one of two things will happen. The minion is still working on it and it says, great, got it, yep, I'm still working on this job, but thanks for asking. And it sends a return back saying basically that I'm still working here. Um, and that process will continue until the minion is finally done with whatever work it was initially asked to do. If there is no response from the minion when the uh, job status request went, has gone out. Um, the local client will just give up on that minion, right? Because we don't want to block 
at the CLI forever, waiting for a minion that might not even be up. <clears throat> so that's how we handle that. Um, and now we will talk about some job management. I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of these before, right? Uh, we have the job runner, so we can uh, list all the jobs that are running. We can look at particular jobs, um, look at their JIDs, right? Um, we can also use the salt util execution module. Um, and that's actually what the local client uses when it's asking about the status of a job. It uses the find job function. Um, you can kill jobs and send different signals to the jobs. And then also, of course, we have a job scheduler. Um, there's a scheduler for the master. There's a scheduler for the minion. Right, so we can schedule all kinds of jobs in all kinds of places, and um, we have all of these things tie into each other, right? So I've, I've, I'm hoping you can see like how this make, means that the reactor is tied into this whole system, or a beacon is tied into this whole system, right? You can listen for all kinds of jobs in all kinds of places. Um, let's see. Going through these really fast because I was a little bit nervous and probably talking too fast. But um, do you guys have any questions at this point so far? Yeah. Great question. So the question was um, if you pass the async flag, does it go through this whole check of the timeout part? process? And the answer is no, it doesn't. So if you pass the async flag, it still goes through the whole process of like assigning a job ID and everything. And you'll see that right when you've used it, it prints out the job ID right there. So that we've gone through that whole process at that point, right? And then, um, but the, it doesn't wait for the minions to come back. And then you can use that job ID to pull for its status later if you're inclined. Oh, lots of questions. We'll start here. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. So the question is, um, let me just make sure I got it right. So you pass this master, or you pass this expected minions list back to the minion from the master, and is there ever a situation where you would get a response from a minion that's not included in that expected minions list? Yeah, it could be. Um, perhaps, I, I think so. That's a good question. I might have to get back to you on that one. Do you know that, uh, Eric? Is Eric? Yeah. I haven't encountered it, but I, I, it's probably possible if you had like a race, like a, the minion key was accepted after the, ma the list was passed to the client, right? Like it's possible um, that the minion would return. So um, yeah, in the back. Okay, it was a little bit hard to hear you from the clapping, but I think the general question is sort of like, how would you debug um, a job that's taking a really long time and you haven't gotten a response from? Yeah, so, um, well, you can look at debug logs. Um, you can, well, one thing I was gonna show you guys, and maybe this would be a good way to do that, is you can watch the event bus. Um, on, you can watch it on the menu, you can watch it on the master. I'll show you a master. Oh, did you have a question? Okay. Is there consensus on how to get? Right. Um, yeah, so the question for if anyone couldn't hear is, uh, is there consensus or some best practices basically on how you can get better insight into long running jobs on the master or on the minions, right? So that you can maybe see those event 
events coming in on the minion side, right? Um, I, that's a really good question. I actually don't know off the top of my head. I mean, I would, the obvious answer to me right now is to actually like subscribe to the minion event bus, but obviously that's like hard to do when you have lots and lots of minions and you have to subscribe to every single one. Um, right, so I'll just show you guys how you can look at the um, uh, minion event bus, whoops. Okay, so there's a file in, um, sorry, in the test directory, so that doesn't come by default with a regular salt install, but it's easy to um, install the testing um, code. And you can fire off the event dot, event listen dot pi file. So we'll see right here, it's looking for the, um, or it's subscribed to that event bus, right? And then on this other side, I'm just going to do, um, oh, I'm gonna start my minion first. And we'll just do it this way. And we should see on that other side, the start event from the minion, right? Like, okay, the minion's up, hooray, there's the event. And then you can start seeing sort of that data structure that we talked about before, um, and then, Let's just look at what that test.ping um, events would look like, right? So at the very top there where it says um, there's like a smaller event, that's the minions, expected minions list coming back. And then the next event is the actual return from the minion of the test.ping. Um, and then we can also look at uh, just a simple example of a longer running job where we're, it's pulling um, and doing those find job requests, you'll see those events coming in as well. Um, yeah, so to answer, I don't think I really answered the original question from the back of the room, um, which was about how to debug some of these longer running jobs. Um, there's the standard answers of looking at the event bus, seeing where those are, um, trying to figure that out that way. Um, debug logs are a great, great way. Um, the talk in this room right after mine is, um, I can't remember the title, but Megan is giving it, and it's gonna be a little bit more in depth about troubleshooting, how to find things, so that might actually be really good to attend that one. Um, yes, in the back. Yeah, so I think your general question is sort of um, where you, you're seeing um, issues potentially in between the local client, when the local client is passing that to the rec server, and then how do you have visibility in between those process? Yeah, sure. Um, I think off the top of my head, what I would probably do is start, you can start firing any kind of events anywhere on that event bus. And so if you wanna like, uh, you know, we went through that publish function where we're doing all that authentication, right? Like, well, maybe you wanna see something fire before we even do those checks, right? And you could potentially, in, you know, in a development environment, you know, start playing around with where those are firing. Um, 
there's probably a lot more other ways you can do that. Um, I, do you have any ideas, Eric? Yeah, um, if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, we can probably um, get you in touch with the right person. Yeah, so it's subscribed to the master's TP, TCP sockets, but then it's also subscribed to its own internal sockets as well. I didn't list all those out, but yeah, so it does the same thing as the master one, just not as, there's not as many events usually being fired, but um, uh, as that long master process as we talked about, but they're um, fired, it, it also has in the internal sockets going, and then it also has um, the subscriptions to the master. Um, so you, you can see those in your um, in your run. Um, uh, where is it? It's var run salt or va, yeah var run salt master, and then and then there's also a minions directory, and you can see all of those different um, socket connections in there because they have a unique ID. So. Um, is, so the question is, is there more things you can use to watch the minion event bus? Um, so you can use the minion event bus to do lots of different things, like um, it, it works similarly to the master one, so whatever's fired on there, you can subscribe to that event bus and pull out events, so you can make your own events if you want to subscribe them. There's um, other things that are going on um, on that uh, event bus that you can just like before. Go ahead, Eric, you can expound on that. Yeah, so in case you guys didn't hear the answer, is sort of you can, you know, there's pillar refreshing going on, there's grains information going on, and you can use that. Since there's no reactor system on the minion itself, you can kind of use it to subscribe to those kinds of events. Yeah. Oh, the expected minions list work with what? Syndics. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, oh. I meant to review this before the thing. Um, so the so a syndic is a minion, right? That's just forwarding those events from the syndic master back up to the other master, and the main master is, if I remember correctly, and Eric, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure there isn't really a way for that top level master to know all of the minions that are um, lower levels down. So the timeout mechanism works a little bit differently. Is that right, Eric? Where Yeah. 
think you had a question right there. Sorry, can you speak a little louder? <laughs> Um, so, this, so you said the the salt util uh, something about a high state and then, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm a little bit hard, hard for me to hear. Um, did you hear what it was, Eric? Um, I was actually, th thanks for the questions, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's reached the end of the time, so I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. I'm sure Eric would be happy to stick around as well. Um, but uh, thank you for coming.